Blessed are those who mourn. Next on One Gospel. On the mountainside, he appoints the twelve apostles, heals, and gives a sermon, taken from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And as you hear this section of the Gospel, a question to consider. What is the comfort that will come to those who mourn? And why will those who weep laugh? Seeing the multitudes, he went up to a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. He lifted up his eyes toward his disciples, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, because the kingdom of the God of heavens is yours. Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. Blessed are those who weep now, because you shall laugh. Blessed are the meek, because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger now, and thirst for righteousness, because you will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, because they will obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, because the kingdom of the heavens is theirs. Blessed are you when men will hate you, and when they will exclude you, and when they will revile you, and when they persecute you, and when they will cast out your name as evil, and when they say all kinds of evil against you falsely, for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, and be exceedingly glad, for your reward is great in the heavens. For in this manner they and their fathers persecuted the prophets who were before you. But woe to you who are rich, because you have received your comfort. Woe to you who are full, because you will hunger. Woe to you that laugh now, because you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers did the same to the false prophets. So we're going to look at these two related um, Beatitudes. Uh, In blue is Matthew, and red is in Luke. So you see that uh, blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted comes from Matthew and blessed are those who weep now because you shall laugh comes from Luke. Jesus in Luke 4.18 had quoted Isaiah 61, 1-2 and he was referring to himself saying it was being fulfilled before the eyes of the people of Nazareth. So he was saying that Isaiah 61.1 was referring to him. And he reads up to the first part of verse 2, where it it proclaims the acceptable year of the Lord. But there was more just after that. Isaiah says, To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. So we see here, in this same passage, that Jesus himself, who is associating himself with that verse, is going to comfort all that mourn. There's also a time at the end of the age when all mourning and weeping will end. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. I think everyone's looking forward to that scenario. But to dig into it a little deeply here, the tabernacle of God is with men. We, we mentioned earlier when we were in the introduction from John that Jesus was said to have tabernacled, meaning to take on flesh. And we also heard in the beginning 
when we are introduced by Matthew, um, one of the prophecies uh, about his birth, he was called Emmanuel, which was translated God with us. So we see here there's multiple there's multiple things here that are pointing to Jesus. So when we look at Isaiah 61, 2, where Jesus said, before your eyes, these things have happened, which is up to the first half of Isaiah 61, 2. The next part was referring to him, but wasn't happening at that time. So the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all that mourn was something that was to come. So Revelation here is identifying when that is. The word for comfort in Greek is parakaleo. Comfort in Hebrew is nakam, and that has a wider meaning. So Jesus may have been using that word, um, and it represents consoling, regret, or repenting. Jesus uses this exact same word, parakaleo, one other time when he was referring to a, um, a poor man, Lazarus, who suffered while living but was comforted after death. Another form of a future comfort, you know, we've talked about two. One is, um, you know, the ultimate end when... Um, when, when all sorrow and death goes away. And the second thing is just the individual comfort at the end of, um, at the end of their life. Um, another future form of comforting was more immediate. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the parakletos. So comforter is the same root as what he said here, you know, that the, those who mourn will be comforted. And he says this three different times, but it was all in the same conversation. It was the last conversation Jesus had with his disciples. And he said specifically that this parakletos would teach them all things. He would testify of Jesus. He would convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Finally, um, the first use of the word um, comforting in the context of mourning in the Torah was the relief of Isaac, the son of Abraham, when he found comfort in his marriage to Rebekah um, after his mother died. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So, you know, a lot of people might say, oh, that's kind of weird. Well, just get away from the weird. Um, and, you know, think about this on a deeper level. Isaac lost his life giver, just as the disciples lost Jesus. And um, Isaac found comfort in a partner, Rebecca. And Jesus told them, hey, I'm leaving, but I'm giving you someone who will be with you um, like a partner. Now, Luke uses weeping, and it's not surprising that mourning is closely associated with weeping. They're essentially equivalent, and there's multiple verses in the New Testament that basically use both words and lump them together. Weeping, the Greek word kleo, correlates consistently with the Hebrew baka. Now, the use of laugh, though, jaleo, is not actually found at all in the Septuagint, um, nor is it used elsewhere in the Christian New Testament except in one um, verse in James where the noun form um, laughter is used. So, what Jesus was talking about, you know, again, assuming he wasn't using that Greek word, uh, a little bit of uncertainty. There is a Hebrew word that we translate in our English translations as laugh. Um, it's called tasak. 
Um, it consistently, though, has a negative connotation. It's like mocking laughing, laughter, you know, the classic. <laughs> anyway, um, it is, however, opposed to weeping um, as an opposite in one instance in Ecclesiastes. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. So this verse was made um, pretty famous by the birds' song um, in the late 60s. You know, the hippies were like, yeah, time for peace, I swear it's not too late. And dude, I'd love to have peace too. We just, I don't know. We haven't had it. America's not into it. Not yet. Anyway, um, this is not a political show. Um, it's also worth noting though, you know, so they have a lot of opposites, right? And as I said, you know, they have a time to weep and a time to laugh. They also say a time to mourn and a time to dance. So, Um, You know, Jesus didn't say, blessed are those who mourn, um, for they will dance. Um, Although, you know, he could have. He could have. Um, That doesn't mean you don't get to dance, though. Hold out. Okay. Now, um, the related noun, sakal, which is laughter, also has a negative connotation to it as well. So, again, it's like, you know, a mocking laughter. Um, Even though... There are times it's related to the more positive mirth, which is closer to what we think of as our laughter, you know, just, you know, kind of just happy, happy joy, happy, happy joy, joy, right? Um, Go ahead, Holly. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful and the end of the mirth is heaviness. Yeah, and so that doesn't have a real positive connotation for laughter and mirth. Um, And Ecclesiastes has a uh, similar verse about this. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart is of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. So you see that um, laughter and mirth are actually being associated with being foolish. And this continued in Sirach. A fool lifteth up his voice with laughter, but a wise man doth scarce smile a little. So, you know, our modern sensibility would say, man, that's, you know, really? A wise man doesn't even smile? But listen, there are different cultures out there, people. And, um, you know, there's, there's cultures that have um they value you know the controlled person doesn't you know that that's what we're seeing however you know when i said um you know the opposite of mourning is is dancing you know it is possible here that um the type of laughter that jesus had in mind was not a mocking laughter but it was a It was a rejoicing. The relief of weeping and mourning specifically is described for the nation of Israel while they were suffering captivity. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And, you know, who was his audience at the time? You know, they, they, were, they were Jews living under the boot of the Roman emperor. And um, they certainly were experiencing that ki- 
captivity as well. And they were, they were hoping, they, they were hoping for freedom as well. So Jesus' audience, then and now, struggle emotionally. You know, the people in front of him, they were struggling. People listening to him right now, today, around the world, struggling. But he tells them that this emotional struggle is what one of the things that makes them blessed. It will ultimately bring them happiness. But we hear in other aspects of his teaching that he will be the one who brings it. And comfort, specifically, it comes at death. And more importantly, it comes at the end of the age for all. And it will also come through the ultimate comforter, God's Holy Spirit, who he promised to his disciples, and that would include you. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.